common animal ancestor. He has evolved successfully in a self-regulating natural environment on which he is dependent for his survival. That dependence is absolute. For although the gorilla is the and to meaningfully alter the natural environment, belongs to the primate man alone. Man, product of an evolutionary process stretching over millions of years. One of the most fragile of Earth's creatures, the builder of civilization, entrusted by nature with the unique but dangerous ability to alter the very conditions that gave him rise. species, survival is measured by the ability to adapt swiftly to changes in the environment. But man has created his own technological world. And today, as the adverse contours of his self-made environment multiply at an ever-accelerating rate, it is becoming increasingly difficult for him to successfully adapt. And like any other animal, modern man faces possible extinction. <laughs> Man has used his unique powers to overcome the limitations of the natural environment in which he evolved. He has manipulated that environment to his own advantage and interfered with the balance in nature, forgetting of nature. Although he's flourished till now, his relatively brief success on Earth does not necessarily promise future survival. For in the long history of life, survival of species has not been the general rule. In the blackness of space, 10 billion years ago, a great cloud of gas and dust began to form. It grew hotter and hotter, and all that is or will be was begun. Five billion years later, into the ever-expanding universe, the sustainer of life, the sun, was born. And from the same cloud of primordial gases, the planet Earth. During its first half billion years, the Earth passed through a molten stage, with lava erupting to the surface through cracks in the cooling crust. Water vapor and gases escaping from the hot interior formed enormous cloud masses, and the Earth was shrouded in darkness. Then, for century on century, it rained. After a billion years, the ocean basins were filled and the sun was shining on the Earth's primeval sea. Under a canopy of air, the continents of the Earth still lay silent barren and lifeless. Then, about two billion years ago, after certain giant molecules acquired the miraculous ability to duplicate themselves, life was begun in the warm primeval sea. The environment that would sustain life had been created. And from these faint beginnings in the sea would emerge the long procession of all living things. All living organisms are interrelated, and the study of man and his environment includes the study of the creatures he emerged from. Ready? Ready. Up we go. At the American Museum of Natural History's research station in the Bahamas, Dr. C. Lavitt Smith studies the life of fish communities. Mars. Hello. 
We're hoping that eventually, as we learn more about fish communities, there will be something that we can apply to the study of our own communities. There is no question that the fishes here are very well adapted to getting along together in what we call a dynamic harmony, in that the fishes are sharing the available resources by utilizing them in different ways. There are some that uh, feed on plants, there are some that feed on small organisms in the midwater, there are some that uh, feed on organisms that dwell down in the holes. Of course, uh, probably most of the fishes feed on other fishes, and uh, there's, there's a balance here. Unlike man, the fish predators are opportunistic feeders, and whenever one type of prey, one preferred type of prey becomes scarce, it will switch and it will begin to feed on something else. Well, this means that the first species then can build up its numbers until it becomes abundant again, and, and uh, in this way, the general balance is maintained. Man isn't like this. There are a number of cases where man has actually forced species, birds in particular, into extinction because he kept hunting them until he got the very last one, or almost the last one. For America's national bird, once favored by hunters, now become a victim of DDT. The museum may be the only destiny. A destiny shared by the wild water buffalo, pushed off his land. The walrus, exploited for centuries, now, even for the Eskimo, difficult to find. Hunted for pleasure and pressed by civilization, the Bengal tiger is on the verge of extinction. Larger even than the giant dinosaurs, the blue whale may soon join the dinosaur in oblivion as a result of its slaughter by man. Although man's toll is great, nature's toll is greater. Of the animal species we know that have ever existed, two-thirds are now extinct. In 1923, an American Museum of Natural History expedition, led by Roy Chapman Andrews, was to mark a milestone in man's search for knowledge of life past. For the first time, motor vehicles were used to journey across Mongolia's Gobi Desert and to carry supplies, a 75 camel caravan. It had not been easy for Roy Chapman Andrews to find support for the Gobi Desert expedition. Many felt he'd return empty-handed, but the Gobi was to prove one of the richest mines of fossil treasure. In the summer of 1923, one of the most remarkable discoveries known to paleontology was made. Eggs shaped differently from those of any bird known, preserved for millions of years by the dry country and loose sand, some lying on the ground, others enclosed in rock. The first dinosaur eggs ever seen by any human being. The elongated eggs were definitely reptilian, and in those that had been broken in half, could be detected the delicate bones of dinosaur embryos. Up until this time, it was not known that dinosaurs laid eggs. The reptiles had evolved out of the sea, and 230 million years ago, the dinosaurs appeared. Growing to 80 feet long, weighing as much as 40 tons, they ruled the earth. Some vegetarian, others vicious predators, in a warm, moist climate, they thrived for millions of years and then disappeared. The trail of the dinosaurs ends at places like Lance Creek, Wyoming. Here today, dinosaur remains are found side by side with those of the mammals that followed them as the Earth's dominant creatures 65 million years ago. Dr. Malcolm McKenna examines an anthill that illuminates the past. The amazing thing about these ants is that they collect all sorts of fossils from hundreds of feet around and bring them into their nest and put them on the top to roof it. It helps protect it against the uh, rain. 
here is a, a jaw of a lizard, and a small mammal jaw is right here. This belongs to a possum. The paleontologist looking for fossils can use a spot like this to find out whether there are any remains here. When he does, for instance, this little remain, a bit of a dinosaur tooth, uh, the scientist knows that he can dig at a spot like this to find the remains. Look at that ant. He's carrying a fragment of a dinosaur tooth in his mouth. I think it's fascinating the way these fossils have lain in the ground around here for 65 million years, ever since the age of dinosaurs. And here they are, collected by the ants. The dinosaurs were present on Earth for more than 100 million years, and yet they finally were unable to adapt and became extinct. Man has been here only a few million years, Let's hope that we have as long as the dinosaurs had before we ultimately become extinct. Erosion is the greatest aid to the paleontologist in search of the past. At Lance Creek, Malcolm McKenna unearths an ancient bone exposed by a heavy summer rain. This is a thigh bone of an extinct dinosaur that lived here at Lance Creek about 65 million years ago, just at the close of the age of dinosaurs. The dinosaurs lasted for perhaps 150 million years or so, and they became extinct and the mammals took over. The dinosaurs had been extremely successful living in a variety of environments that had been fairly constant uh, through the age of dinosaurs, but at the end, the climate changed. It became more varied, the winters became cooler, the summers perhaps hotter, and the dinosaurs being technically cold-blooded couldn't make it through the long winters. At least that's one very popular theory, and it's one that I think is a, a logical one. The extinction of the dinosaurs then was because they couldn't adapt to a new environment. The mammals had been around for some time before. They had been around at least as long as the dinosaurs. But at the end of the age of dinosaurs, they were somehow better adapted to the new environment and began to evolve into a number of lineages that led up to the modern animals that we're familiar with today. All animal species we see today, including the birds, whose appearance on Earth followed soon after that of mammals, have survived only by their successful response to their environment. Lion cubs two months old must learn from their mother the hunting techniques that will be essential to their survival. As predators in training, the cubs must learn their prey. Survival for the predator is in the attack and the kill. The prize, a wildebeest, three times the weight of the lion is now delivered to the waiting cubs. Having observed the kill, the cubs are ready to share the spoils. Lions kill only what they need to eat. When they are about a year old, their cubs have learned enough to hunt their own prey. East Africa's Serengeti Plains are subject to great droughts, for its animals, a once rich and giving environment, may suddenly turn barren and hostile. Elephants possess the ability to detect moisture beneath the ground, and they can still find a little water in the shallow wells they dig in dried up riverbeds. The great beasts have found just enough water to keep them alive to search for more. 
In the natural world, success is measured by a species' survival, and all organisms must find the food, water, and energy that they need for survival where they live. For the smaller animals of the sun-baked plains, the elephants have left behind a small but welcome gift of time. Month after month, for hundreds of miles, the elephants search for water, assisting their young, now failing and beginning to fall behind. The drought continues. It's in a world turned entirely to sand that they'll wander, with all the animals for whom they'd provided water following behind. A dried up water hole entraps a young gazelle. When it was filled, the water hole nourished life. Empty, it becomes a tomb. continues, and over the Serengeti, the scavengers hover, drawn by the smell of death. The elephants will not easily yield their youngest fallen. For vultures, there's food and drink. In the natural world, amidst death and disease, it's the scavengers that thrive and survive. In East Africa, the drought begun in 1960 lasted nearly two years. Not for two years did a desperate search for food and water end. Life began in water. It's water that makes the earth unique. It's the primary ingredient in every living plant and animal. It's a primary sustainer of life. Together, they share the same earth, water, and air. They are united in delicate interdependence. And in the words of the poet Robinson Jeffers, not man a <laughs> In their friendly environment, chimp groups live in harmony. And what appears to be a violent quarrel is in reality violent play. wild chimpanzee strips the leaves from a twig and then sticks that twig into a termite hole in order to draw out the termites. He is not only using a tool, he has made one. In the evolution of primates, it is said that with the making of tools, early man began. The apes are related to man, but they are not the group man emerged from. In the history of primate evolution, which began 70 million years ago, man represents a relatively recent and unique development. It was in Africa, about two million years ago, that earliest known man emerged. And over the course of the centuries, from Zingantopus through Neanderthal to Cro-Magnon and man today, the most remarkable and significant thing about him has been the phenomenal growth of his brain. 
In the American Museum of Natural History, Dr. Harry Shapiro. What is man that thou art mindful of him is a question that has for many, many years. Between two and three billion years ago, when life first began, until about two million years ago, there were no men on the earth at all. And then, developing out of the primates, we see the first evidence of man-like creatures. Adapted to tree living, they had developed a grasping hand and an ability to stand semi-erect with considerable ease. It was this ability that allowed the ancestors of man to take to ground living. Ground living freed the hand, freed it for other uses. And one of these was the development of technology. A very simple kind of technology, it is true, but nevertheless, without the hand, and the brain. It could never have evolved. For many thousands of years, evolving man lived like other creatures, dependent, dependent upon his environment, disturbing it. He was a hunter and a gatherer. A way of life which we can still see today among many primitive people who still depend upon nature in the same manner disturbing it in any way. One such people are the Bambuti Pygmies, who for thousands lived as hunters and gatherers in the Congo's Ituri forest. Their forest life has been studied at close range by anthropologist Colin Turnbull. Probably the most significant thing about the Pygmies is their relationship with their environment. Its completeness and certainly to me its incredible intimacy because for the pygmies, the forest is something very real, and they live with it, they live in it, they talk to it, they sing to it. When they go through the forest, uh, always they will be talking and shouting and addressing it as mother and father as though it were a real living entity. If you ask them why refer to the forest as mother or father, they say, as you might expect, that, well, like our parents, the forest provides us with everything. It gives us our food, it gives us our shelter, it gives us our clothing. It's a practical relationship between the people and their environment. But the pygmies go further, and they say, and also, like our mother and father, the forest gives us affection. You get this feeling of, um, a large family, and this family relationship characterizes their whole life. So there's very little um, assertion of individuality of one person against another, of one group against another. Everyone is made to feel a part of the total environment. Unlike the pygmies, their forest neighbors, Bantu villagers, must dominate their environment. They're farmers who live by cutting down a part of the forest. Every three years, in the center of their village, a ritual takes place by and pygmy bays are initial and the villagers preside. They see pygmy participation as evidence of their own domination. To toughen them up for manhood, the boys are subjected to physical ordeal. Pygmies brought up in the forest don't need toughening up, but they humor the villagers by abiding their ceremonial rules. Colin Turnbull. The intriguing thing is that here are these two people who could be extremely hostile, who have it in their power to resolve this hostility through warfare, and yet who manage to live in peace. With the pygmies and the villagers, you have an example of two people reacting to the same environment in a totally different way. There is an element of choice, and each people make their own choice quite deliberately. Sometimes, however, the environment itself dominates us, and there may be people in uh, northern Uganda, the Ik. It is a story that has many lessons for us. It tells us what can become of us as human beings if we concentrate too much on the problem of surviving physically. A small tribe of about a thousand, the Ik were once hunters and gatherers. 
living in sympathy with their environment. Then, forced by political change to give up hunting, they turned to farming in a harsh, unyielding land prone to drought. The net result over a period of some 30 years is that today the Ich are slowly starving to death. And they're doing more than die out physically, they're dying out morally, they're dying out spiritually. And in a sense, in a sense, I think that most of us would understand the term human being. They are no longer human. I've seen men die while their wives are healthy and plump and quite content to go out and get their own food and come back at the end of a day well fed and see their husband lying there dying of starvation or dying of thirst. No one would dream of bringing back food or water for their kin, simply because they cannot afford to. It is a situation in which they have concentrated on physical survival and this has led to a morality, if you can call it such, where every man is entitled to fend for himself and no one is expected to look after anyone else. I spent nearly two years there, and not once in those two years did I see the slightest sign of love. I didn't see anything even that I could call affection, not even between a mother and a child, certainly not between a husband and a wife. Uh, children are thrown out when they're three years old to find their own food. A mother will reluctantly breastfeed her child until that age, then the child is turned out and has to go and find its own food in this very, very hostile environment. No child expects to be fed by a parent. No parent expects to be fed by a child. The moment you are unable to find your own food, you die. When I first got there, there were some old people still alive who remembered days in which uh, people had helped each other. Now there is not a single person alive who even remembers an act of kindness, and this has become the system. The Ik fool themselves into thinking that they are surviving, and they are surviving, but only, in a sense, as animals, not as human beings. Now this makes us question very carefully how we are going to face the future. And it should make us think very carefully about how we want to survive and how we are going to choose to survive. If we're concerned solely with physical survival, and this is the way that most of us are thinking, then perhaps we're going to end up the way that the Ik have ended up, for people without love. New Guinea Highlands. It's a time for celebration. An enemy has been slain, avenging ghosts appeased. These are the Dugumdani, and their environment is war. War indispensable and sacred, ritualized and without end. Even as they dance, they know that the enemy must now, in his turn, take a life from among them. Watchtowers are manned to guard against surprise attack. This is intertribal warfare. 50,000 Neolithic warrior farmers divided into a dozen alliances, each a potential enemy of the others. Across a no man's land is the enemy. He speaks the same language, shares the same culture, and with a life taken, he must appease the same malevolent spirits. Centuries of warfare have conditioned the culture of the Dani. Tending their gardens and fields, they are ever on the alert against attack that they expect and want to come. With heavy grass darts as weapons, future warriors begin early in life the serious practice of the arts of war. At last, that for which they've been waiting has come. A fire set on the frontier. Sufficient cause for alarm. Once more, the ritual has begun.
fight not for land or domination, not from patriotism or from desire to put an end to war. They fight simply because they're Donny, and Donny war. With the enemy shooting arrows at 50 feet, agility and concentration are required. Skirmishes last about 10 minutes and involve about 200 men. The day's fighting consists of from 10 to 20 clashes, and by late afternoon, they're ready to go home before it gets dark. In the formalized battle, most wounds suffered are minor. Too late for further battle, verbal insults are traded. Both sides know each other by name. For now, the battle is over. There have been wounded, but no fatalities. The enemy will have to appease his ghosts another day. Finally, it is the time for mourning. A small boy has been killed in ambush. After weeks of indecisive battle, the enemy have avenged their death. In a special funeral chair, the body is displayed, adorned with valuables brought by the funeral guests. In the funeral ceremony, it is customary that those closest to the victim supply a pig for the feast that will follow a period of intense mourning. That it is ritualized mourning does not diminish the grief they feel. Mid-afternoon, as the ceremony draws to a close, the boy's body is prepared for cremation. In the fire, the Donny believe, his ghost will be released. And until the living avenge it, it will not rest. Now, across no man's land, it is the enemy who dances. The cycle continues. Dr. Margaret Mead comments. The Downey are especially interesting to us because they're trapped in this endless round of killing and revenge and killing and revenge. It's characteristic of our very primitive ancestors that they lived in ways like this sometimes for many thousands of years. It's an extraordinary caricature of what has happened to civilization often too as two groups of people define themselves as enemies and don't know how to get out of the definition so that they go on revenging, reprisal, revenging, without any way of escaping from the situation which they themselves have defined. In 1965, for National Educational Television, anthropologist Margaret Mead revisited New Guinea's Manus people. It was a joyous reunion with the people she had been studying since 1928. For Margaret Mead, there has been the unique opportunity to personally witness over the years an extraordinary cultural transformation representative of changes now taking place all over the world. The evolution of the Manus people from their stone age into the 20th century. We study primitive people to give us some idea of the way in which our remote ancestors adjusted to their environment with their very primitive tools and technology. And this gives us a, a sort of contrast for understanding what is happening today. In 1928, when I studied the people of Perry Village, the Manus of the Admiralty Islands, they were living in the sea. 
and they lived close to their fishing ground, and people who were beautifully adjusted to the environment. They had big outrigger canoes, and in their canoes they could go from island to island to collect the products made or grown by other people around them. The sea was not overfished, the land was not overplanted, and the whole archipelago was perfectly balanced with these people whose population increased very, very slowly because they had no medical care and no way of saving most of their children's lives. In 1953, when I went back to visit them after World War II, I found that they had remodeled their entire society. The lagoon-dwelling people had moved ashore and they'd begun to set up a skeleton imitation of what they understood our society to be. And as they came into the modern world, they also began to pay the prices that are associated with the modern world. So that when I went back in 1965, they were overcrowded, they were dealing with water pollution, and they had their first juvenile delinquent. We study people like this not only to understand earlier phases of the relationship of man to his environment, but also to understand what is happening all over the world now. As a single urbanization process spreads over the face of the earth and even touches tiny fishing villages in New Guinea. Today, all the peoples of the world are moving into the same world a world created by the speeded up technology of the 20th century, a world shaped by the men and events of that time, which after four and a half billion years of Earth history may be viewed as the time of modern civilized man. The 20th century.
20th century, man reached for the moon and developed the technology to grasp it. He traveled backwards in time and saw what his own planet looked like in its primordial beginnings. Although man may travel in space and visit the moon, the Earth is still his home. Because it's unique, at least for now, it's the only accessible planet that can sustain his life. Pollution is contamination of the environment and interferes with the processes of life. In seeking a better life on Earth, man in the 20th century has created a great technology at the expense of the environment essential to life. Like the bald eagle, he may now be considered an endangered species. The basic cause of the problem is people. As the population of the world rapidly increases, the greater the demand on the Earth's basic resources of land, water, and air. This planet's capacity to yield sustenance and to receive waste is not boundless. And in the next 30 years, the Earth's population will increase more than it has in the last million. To man in the 20th century, it poses a greater threat than anything he's experienced before. Dr. Harry Shapiro. People, people, all facing disaster if they don't find the solution for the population explosion that now threatens the world. At the moment, the population is over 3 billion. In another generation, it will be 7 billion. And a generation after that, 14 billion. And so it goes. In the not very distant future, a world so crowded that mankind can scarcely survive. Because man, like all other creatures, needs and depends upon the oxygen, the water, the food that is provided by the self-balancing environment of nature. And this is being threatened by the technology that makes civilization possible. can't do anything about it anyway. I just try to scare you. I bet it's not as bad as they say it is. Can Man Survive is the theme of the American Museum of Natural History's centennial exhibition. It was produced under the direction of Dr. Shapiro, curator emeritus of the museum's Department of Anthropology. Can man survive? To be or not to be? That is the subject of this exhibit. It's a hard question, and there are no easy answers. Up until only about 10,000 years ago, man was simply a hunting, gathering animal, in no way disturbing, fundamentally, the environment upon which he depended. But beginning with agriculture, and with increasing tempo ever since, he has been interfering with the natural processes of nature. Through his success in technology and industry, he is threatening the natural environment upon which he depends through pollution of water and air and through pesticides. If man does not develop the wisdom to maintain his environment in a way that will not threaten the natural environment, which is basic to all life. The answer can only be disaster. Man is no simple species of animal. He has harnessed the power of the atom. He has reached the moon. He is also the only species with the capacity to understand his place on Earth and the natural laws that govern him. It is in the utilization of that knowledge that his salvation lies, and that he may rightly call himself Homo sapiens, man of wisdom.